woman within. Difficult and subtle ethical problems are not invariably brought up by the appearance of the shadow itself. Often another inner figure emerges. If the dreamer is a man, he will discover a female personification of his unconscious, and it will be a male figure in the case of a woman. Often this second symbolic figure turns up behind the shadow, bringing up new and different problems. Jung called its male and female forms animus and anima. The anima is a personification of all feminine psychological tendencies in a man's psyche, such as vague feelings and moods, prophetic hunches, receptiveness to the irrational, capacity for personal love, feeling for nature, and last but not least, his relation to the unconscious. It is no mere chance that in olden times priestesses, like the Greek Sibyl, were used to fathom the divine will and to make connection with the gods. A particularly good example of how the anima is experienced as an inner figure in a man's psyche is found in the medicine men and prophets, the shamans among the Eskimo and other Arctic tribes. Some of these even wear women's clothes or have breasts depicted on their garments in order to manifest their inner feminine side, the side that enables them to connect with the ghost land, what we call the unconscious. One reported case tells of a young man who was being initiated by an older shaman and who was buried by him in a snow hole. He fell into a state of dreaminess and exhaustion. In this coma, he suddenly saw a woman who emitted light. She instructed him in all he needed to know and later, as his protective spirit, helped him to practice his difficult profession by relating him to the powers of the beyond. Such an experience shows the anima as the personification of a man's unconscious. In its individual manifestation, the character of a man's anima is as a rule shaped by his mother. If he feels that his mother had a negative influence on him, his anima will often express itself in irritable, depressed moods, uncertainty, insecurity, and touchiness. If, however, he is able to overcome the negative assaults on himself, they can even serve to reinforce his masculinity. Within the soul of such a man, the negative mother anima figure will endlessly repeat this theme. I am nothing. Nothing makes any sense. With others, it's different, but for me, I enjoy nothing. These anima moods cause a sort of dullness, a fear of disease, of impotence, or of accidents. The whole of life takes on a sad and oppressive aspect. Such dark moods can even lure a man to suicide, in which case the anima becomes a death demon. She appears in this role in Cocteau's film, Orphée. The French call such an anima figure a femme fatale. A milder version of this dark anima is personified by the queen of the night in Mozart's magic flute. The Greek sirens or the German Lorelei also personify this dangerous aspect of the anima, which in this form symbolizes destructive illusion. The following Siberian tale illustrates the behavior of such a destructive anima. One day a lonely hunter sees a beautiful woman emerging from the deep forest on the other side of the river. She waves at him and sings, Oh, come, lonely hunter, in the stillness of dusk. Come, come, I miss you, I miss you. Now I will embrace you, embrace you. Come, come, my nest is near, my nest is near. Come, come, lonely hunter, now in the stillness of dusk. He throws off his clothes and swims across the river, but suddenly she flies away in the form of an owl, laughing mockingly at him. But when he tries to swim back to find his clothes, he drowns in the cold river. In this tale, the anima symbolizes an unreal dream of love, happiness, and maternal warmth, her nest, a dream that lures men away from reality. The hunter is drowned because he ran after a wishful fantasy that could not be fulfilled. Another way in which the negative anima in a man's personality can be revealed is in waspish, poisonous, effeminate remarks by which he devalues everything. Remarks of this sort always contain a cheap twisting of the truth and are in a subtle way destructive. There are legends throughout the world in which a poison damsel, as they call her in the Orient, appears. She is a beautiful creature who has weapons hidden in her body or a secret poison with which she kills her lovers during their first night together. In this guise, the anima is as cold and reckless as certain uncanny aspects of nature itself, and in Europe is often expressed to this day by the belief in witches. If, on the other hand, a man's experience of his mother has been positive, this can also affect his anima in typical but different ways, with the result that he either becomes effeminate or is preyed upon by women and thus is unable to cope with the hardships of life. 
An anima of this sort can turn men into sentimentalists, or they may become as touchy as old maids, or as sensitive as the fairy tale princess who could feel a pea under thirty mattresses. A still more subtle manifestation of a negative anima appears in some fairy tales in the form of a princess who asks her suitors to answer a series of riddles, or perhaps to hide themselves under her nose. If they cannot give the answers, or if she can find them, they must die, and she invariably wins. The anima in this guise involves men in a destructive intellectual game. We can notice the effect of this anima trick in all those neurotic pseudo-intellectual dialogues that inhibit a man from getting into direct touch with life and its real decisions. He reflects about life so much that he cannot live it and loses all his spontaneity and outgoing feeling. The most frequent manifestations of the anima takes the form of erotic fantasy. Men may be driven to nurse their fantasies by looking at films and striptease shows or by daydreaming over pornographic material. This is a crude, primitive aspect of the anima, which becomes compulsive only when a man does not sufficiently cultivate his feeling relationships, when his feeling attitude toward life has remained infantile. All these aspects of the anima have the same tendency that we have observed in the shadow. That is, they can be projected so that they appear to the man to be the qualities of some particular woman. It is the presence of the anima that causes a man to fall suddenly in love when he sees a woman for the first time and knows at once that this is she. In this situation, the man feels as if he has known this woman intimately for all time. He falls for her so helplessly that it looks to outsiders like complete madness. Women who are of fairy-like character especially attract such anima projections because men can attribute almost anything to a creature who is so fascinatingly vague and can thus proceed to weave fantasies around her. The projection of the anima in such a sudden and passionate form as a love affair can greatly disturb a man's marriage and can lead to the so-called human triangle with its accompanying difficulties. A bearable solution to such a drama can be found only if the anima is recognized as an inner power. The secret aim of the unconscious in bringing about such an entanglement is to force a man to develop and to bring his own being to maturity by integrating more of his unconscious personality and bringing it into his real life. But I have said enough about the negative side of the anima. There are just as many important positive aspects. The anima is, for instance, responsible for the fact that a man is able to find the right marriage partner. Another function is at least equally important. Whenever a man's logical mind is incapable of a discerning facts that are hidden in his unconscious, the anima helps him to dig them out. Even more vital is the role that the anima plays in putting a man's mind in tune with the right inner values and thereby opening the way into more profound inner depths. It is as if an inner radio becomes tuned to a certain wavelength that excludes irrelevancies, but allows the voice of the great man to be heard. In establishing this inner radio reception, the anima takes on the role of guide or mediator to the world within and to the self. That is how she appears in the example of the initiations of the shamans that I described earlier. This is the role of Beatrice in Dante's Paradiso and also of the goddess Isis when she appeared in a dream to Apuleius, the famous author of The Golden Ass, in order to initiate him into a higher, more spiritual form of life. The dream of a 45-year-old psychotherapist may help to make clear how the anima can be an inner guide. As he was going to bed on the evening before he had this dream, he thought to himself that it was hard to stand alone in life, lacking the support of a church. He found himself envying people who are protected by the maternal embrace of an organization. He had been born a Protestant, but no longer had any religious affiliation. This was his dream. I am in the aisle of an old church filled with people. Together with my mother and my wife, I sit at the end of the aisle in what seem to be extra seats. I am to celebrate the Mass as a priest, and I have a big Mass book in my hands, or rather a prayer book, or an anthology of poems. This book is not familiar to me and I cannot find the right text. I am very excited because I have to begin soon and to add to my troubles my mother and wife disturb me by chattering about unimportant trifles. Now the organ stops and everyone is waiting for me. So I get up in a determined way and ask one of the nuns who is kneeling behind me to hand me her mass book 
and point out the right place, which he does in an obliging manner. Now, like a sort of sexton, this same nun precedes me to the altar, which is somewhere behind me and to the left, as if we are approaching it from a side aisle. The mass book is like a sheet of pictures, a sort of board, three feet long and a foot wide, and on it is the text with ancient pictures in columns, one beside the other. First the nun has to read a part of the liturgy before I begin, and I have still not found the right place in the text. She has told me that it is number 15, but the numbers are not clear and I cannot find it. With determination, however, I turn toward the congregation and now I have found number 15, the next to the last on the board. Although I do not yet know if I shall be able to decipher it, I want to try all the, si all the same. I wake up. This dream expressed in a symbolic way an answer from the unconscious to the thoughts that the dreamer had the evening before. It said to him, in effect, you yourself must become a priest in your own inner church, in the church of your soul. Thus the dream shows that the dreamer does have the helpful support of an organization. He is contained in a church, not an external church, but one that exists inside his own soul. The people, all his own psychic qualities, want him to function as the priest and celebrate the Mass himself. Now the dream cannot mean the actual Mass, for its Mass book is very different from the real one. It seems that the idea of the Mass is used as a symbol, and therefore it means a sacrificial act in which the divinity is present so that man can communicate with it. This symbolic solution is, of course, not generally valid, but relates to this particular dreamer. It is a typical solution for a Protestant, because a man who, through real faith, is still contained in the Catholic Church, usually experiences his anima in the image of the Church herself, and her sacred images are, for him, the symbols of the unconscious. Our dreamer did not have this ecclesiastical experience, and this is why he had to follow an inner way. Furthermore, the dream told him what he should do. It said, your mother boundness and your extroversion represented by the wife who is an extrovert distract you and make you feel insecure and by meaningless talk keep you from celebrating the inner mass. But if you follow the nun, the introverted anima, she will lead you as both a servant and a priest. She owns a strange mass book which is composed of 16 four times four ancient pictures. Your mass consists of your contemplation of these psychic images that your religious anima reveals to you. In other words, if the dreamer overcomes his inner uncertainty caused by his mother complex, he will find that his life task has the nature and quality of a religious service, and that if he meditates about the symbolic meaning of the images in his soul, they will lead him to this realization. In this dream, the anima appears in her proper positive role, that is, as a mediator between the ego and the self. The four times four configuration of the pictures points to the fact that the celebration of this inner mass is performed in the service of totality. As Jung has demonstrated, the nucleus of the psyche, the self, normally expresses itself in some kind of fourfold structure. The number four is also connected with the anima because, as Jung noted, there are four stages in its development. The, the first stage is best symbolized by the figure of Eve, which represents purely instinctual and biological relations. The second can be seen in Faust's Helen. She personifies a romantic and aesthetic level that is, however, still characterized by sexual elements. The third is represented, for instance, by the Virgin Mary, a figure who raises love, eros, to the heights of spiritual devotion. The fourth type is symbolized by sapientia, wisdom transcending even the most holy and the most pure. Of this, another symbol is the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon. In the psychic development of modern man, this stage is rarely reached. The Mona Lisa comes nearest to such a wisdom anima. At this stage, I am only pointing out that the concept of fourfoldness frequently occurs in certain types of symbolic material. The essential aspects of this will be discussed later. But what does the role of the anima as guide to the inner world mean in practical terms? This positive function occurs when a man takes seriously the feelings, moods, expectations, and fantasies sent by his anima, and when he fixes them in some form, for example, in writing, painting, sculpture, musical composition, or dancing. When he works at this patiently and slowly, other more deeply unconscious material wells up from the depths and connects with the earlier material. After a fantasy has been fixed in some specific form, it must be examined both intellectually and ethically with an evaluating feeling reaction. 
and it is essential to regard it as being absolutely real. There must be no lurking doubt that this is only a fantasy. If this is practiced with devotion over a long period, the process of individuation gradually becomes the single reality and can unfold in its true form. Many examples from literature show the anima as a guide and mediator to the inner world. In a medieval mystical text, an anima figure explains her own nature as follows. I am the flower of the field and the lily of the valleys. I am the mother of fair love and of fear and of knowledge and of holy hope. I am the mediator of the elements, making one to agree with another. That which is warm I make cold and the reverse, and that which is dry I make moist and the reverse, and that which is hard I soften. I am the law in the priest and the word in the prophet and the counsel in the wise. I will kill and I will make to live, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. In the Middle Ages, there took place a perceptible spiritual differentiation in religious, poetical, and other cultural matters, and the fantasy world of the unconscious was recognized more clearly than before. During this period, the knightly cult of the lady signified an attempt to differentiate the feminine side of man's nature in regard to the outer woman as well as in relation to the inner world. The lady to whose service the knight pledged himself and for whom he performed his heroic deeds was naturally a personification of the anima. The name of the carrier of the grail in Wolfram von Eschenbach's version of the legend is especially significant, Conduir Amour, Guide in Love Matters. She taught the hero to differentiate both his feelings and his behavior toward women. Later, however, this individual and personal effort of developing the relationship with the anima was abandoned when her sublime aspect fused with the figure of the Virgin, who then became the object of boundless devotion and praise. When the anima as Virgin was conceived as being all positive, her negative aspects found expression in the belief in witches. In China, the figure parallel to that of Mary is the goddess Kuan Yin. A more popular Chinese anima figure is the Lady of the Moon, who bestows the gift of poetry or music on her favorites and can even give them immortality. In India, the same archetype is represented by Shakti, Parvati, Rati, and many others. Among the Muslims, she is chiefly Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. Worship of the anima as an officially recognized religious figure brings the serious disadvantage that she loses her individual aspects. On the other hand, if she is regarded as an exclusively personal being, there is the danger that if she is projected into the outer world, it is only there that she can be found. This latter state of affairs can create endless trouble because man becomes either the victim of his erotic fantasies or compulsively dependent on one actual woman. Only the painful but essentially simple decision to take one's fantasies and feelings seriously can at this stage prevent a complete stagnation of the inner process of individuation because only in this way can a man discover what this figure means as an inner reality. Thus the anima becomes again what she originally was, the woman within who conveys the vital messages of the self. Jung's point is that every man has this anima within, her, within him. And this personification of woman is made up of the elements of mother as well as of karmic elements. In order to arrive at the perfected woman, Jung is saying we have to go through the fantasies. We have to go through the feelings we have regarding this inner woman. We have to work through them until we have resolved ourselves with them then we can transcend them, then we can have as our role model Mother Mary or Kuan Yin, etc., who are idealized beings. The animus, the man within. The male personification of the unconscious in woman, the animus, exhibits both good and bad aspects as does the anima in man. But the animus does not so often appear in the form of an erotic fantasy or mood. It is more apt to take the form of a hidden, sacred conviction. When such a conviction is preached with a loud, insistent, masculine voice or imposed on others by means of brutal, emotional scenes, the underlying masculinity in a woman is easily recognized. However, even in a woman who is outwardly very feminine, the animus can be an equally hard, inexorable power. One may suddenly find oneself up against something in a woman that is obstinate, cold, and completely inaccessible. One of the favorite themes that the animus repeats endlessly in the ruminations of this kind of woman goes like this. 
The only thing in the world that I want is love, and he doesn't love me. Or in this situation, there are only two possibilities, and both are equally bad. The animus never believes in exceptions. One can rarely contradict an animus opinion because it is usually right in a general way, yet it seldom seems to fit the individual situation. It is apt to be an opinion that seems reasonable, but beside the point. Just as the character of a man's anima is shaped by his mother, so the animus is basically influenced by a woman's father. The father endows his daughter's animus with a special coloring of unarguable, incontestably true convictions, convictions that never include the personal reality of the woman herself as she actually is. This is why the animus is sometimes like the anima, a demon of death. For example, in a gypsy fairy tale, a handsome stranger is received by a lonely woman in spite of the fact that she has had a dream warning her that he is the king of the dead. After he has been with her for a time, she presses him to tell her who he really is. At first he refuses, saying that she will die if he tells her. She insists, however, and suddenly he reveals to her that he is death himself. The woman immediately dies of fright. Viewed mythologically, the beautiful stranger is probably a pagan father image or god image who appears here as king of the dead, like Hades' abduction of Persephone. But psychologically, he represents a particular form of the animus that lures women away from all human relationships and especially from all contacts with real men. He personifies a cocoon of dreamy thoughts filled with desire and judgments about how things ought to be, which cut a woman off from the reality of life. The negative animus does not appear only as a death demon. In myths and fairy tales, he plays the role of robber and murderer. One example is Bluebeard, who secretly kills all his wives in a hidden chamber. In this form, the animus personifies all those semi-conscious, cold, destructive reflections that invade a woman in the small hours, especially when she has failed to realize some obligation of feeling. It is then that she begins to think about the family heritage and matters of that kind, a sort of web of calculating thoughts filled with malice and intrigue, which get her into a state where she even wishes death to others. When one of us dies, I'll move to the Riviera, said a woman to her husband when she saw the beautiful Mediterranean coast, a thought that was rendered rel relatively harmless by reason of the fact that she said it. By nursing secret destructive attitudes, a wife can drive her husband and a mother her children into illness, accident, or even death. Or she may decide to keep the children from marrying, a deeply hidden form of evil that rarely comes to the surface of the mother's conscious mind. A naive old woman once said to me while showing me a picture of her son who was drowned when he was 27, I prefer it this way. It's better than giving him away to another woman. A strange passivity and paralysis of all feeling or a deep insecurity that can lead almost to a sense of nullity may sometimes be the result of an unconscious animus opinion. In the depths of woman's being, the animus whispers, you are hopeless, what's the use of trying? There is no point in doing anything. Life will never change for the better. Unfortunately, whenever one of these personifications of the unconscious takes possession of our mind, it seems as if we ourselves are having such thoughts and feelings. The ego identifies with them to the point where it is unable to detach them and see them for what they are. One is really, quote, possessed by the figure from the unconscious. Only after the possession has fallen away does one realize with horror that one has said and done things diametrically opposed to one's real thoughts and feelings, that one has been the prey of an alien psychic factor. This is what we call aggressive mental suggestion. This is exactly what we're talking about when we name that in our decrees. Like the anima, the animus does not merely consist of negative qualities such as brutality, recklessness, empty talk, and silent, obstinate, evil ideas. He too has a very positive and valuable side. He too can build a bridge to the self through his creative activity. The following dream of a woman of 45 may help to illustrate this point. Two veiled figures climb onto the balcony and into the house. They are swathed in black hooded coats and they seem to want to torment me and my sister. She hides under the bed, but they pull her out with a broom and torture her. Then it is my turn. The leader of the two pushes me against the wall, making magical gestures before my face. In the meantime, his helper makes a sketch on the wall, and when, and when I see it, I say, in order to seem friendly, Oh, but this is well drawn. 
Now suddenly my tormentor has the noble head of an artist, and he says proudly, yes indeed, and begins to clean his spectacles. The sadistic aspect of these two figures was well known to the dreamer, for in reality she frequently suffered bad attacks of anxiety, during which she was haunted by the thought that people she loved were in great danger, or even that they were dead. But the fact that the animus figure in the dream is double suggests that the burglars personify a psychic factor that is dual in its effect, and that could be something quite different from these tormenting thoughts. The sister of the dreamer who runs away from the men is caught and tortured. In reality, this sister died when fairly young. She had been artistically gifted but had made very little use of her talent. Next, the dream reveals that the veiled burglars are actually disguised artists, and that if the dreamer recognizes their gifts, which are her own, they will give up their evil intentions. What is the deeper meaning of the dream? It is that behind the spasms of anxiety, there is indeed a genuine and mortal danger. But there is also a creative possibility for the dreamer. She, like the sister, had some talent as a painter, but she doubted whether painting could be a meaningful activity for her. Now her dream tells her in the most earnest way that she must live out this talent. If she obeys, the destructive tormenting animus will be transformed in a creative and meaningful activity. As in this dream, the animus often appears as a group of men. In this way, the unconscious symbolizes the fact that the animus represents a collective rather than a personal element. Because of this collective mindedness, women habitually refer, when their animus is speaking through them, to one or they or everybody. And in such circumstances, their speech frequently contains the words always and should and ought. A vast number of myths and fairy tales tell of a prince turned by witchcraft into a wild animal or monster who is redeemed by the love of a girl, a process symbolizing the manner in which the animus becomes conscious. Dr. Henderson has commented on the significance of this beauty and the beast motif in the preceding chapter. Very often the heroine is not allowed to ask questions about her mysterious unknown lover and husband, or she meets him only in the dark and may never look at him. The implication is that by blindly trusting and loving him, she will be able to redeem her bridegroom. But this never succeeds. She always breaks her promise and finally finds her lover again only after a long, difficult quest and much suffering. The parallel in life is that the conscious attention a woman has to give to her animus problem takes much time and involves a lot of suffering. But if she realizes who and what her animus is and what he does to her, and if she faces these realities instead of allowing herself to be possessed, her animus can turn into an invaluable inner companion who endows her with the masculine qualities of initiative, courage, objectivity, and spiritual wisdom. The animus, just like the anima, exhibits four stages of development. He first appears as a personification of mere physical power, for instance, as an athletic champion or muscle man. In the next stage, he possesses initiative and the capacity for planned action. In the third phase, the animus becomes the word, often appearing as a professor or clergyman. Finally, in his fourth manifestation, the animus is the incarnation of meaning. On this highest level, he becomes, like the anima, a mediator of the religious experience whereby life acquires new meaning. He gives the woman spiritual firmness and invisible inner support that compensates for her outer softness. The animus in his most developed form sometimes connects the woman's mind with the spiritual evolution of her age and can thereby make her even more receptive than a man to new creative ideas. It is for this reason that in earlier times women were used by many nations as diviners and seers. The creative boldness of their positive animus at times expresses thoughts and ideas that stimulate men to new enterprises. The inner man within a woman's psyche can lead to marital troubles similar to those mentioned in the section on the anima. What makes things especially complicated is the fact that the possession of one partner by the animus or anima may automatically exert such an irritating effect upon the other that he or she becomes possessed too. Animus and anima always tend to drag conversation down to a very low level and to produce a disagreeable, irascible, emotional atmosphere. As I mentioned before, the positive side of the animus can personify an enterprising spirit, courage, truthfulness, and in the highest form, spiritual profundity. Through him, a woman can experience the underlying process of her cultural and personal objective situation and can find her way to an intensified spiritual attitude to life. This naturally pre presupposes that her animus ceases to represent opinions that are above criticism. 
The woman must find the courage and inner broad-mindedness to question the sacredness of her own convictions. Only then will she be able to take in the suggestions of the unconscious, especially when they contradict her animus opinions. Only then will the manifestations of the self get through to her and will she be able to consciously understand their meaning. This teaching is very profound and I would like to tell you that in the final analysis what we find is that the perfected animus in woman is the manifestation of the Holy Christ Self and the I Am Presence and the perfected anima in man is the same. And as we are moving toward that perfected state we are working through what we have endowed ourselves with, what our mothers have endowed us with as we are men, what our fathers have endowed us with as we are women, and what we have brought with us from other lifetimes. We build upon those fourfold steps because they, re they represent the four quadrants of our cosmic clock, which represent our four lower bodies. So we have to go through the image of mother in the etheric quadrant, the mental quadrant, the astral body, and the physical. When all these come together and we recognize our female counterpart as men, our male counterpart as women, we are in tune with the androgynous self. And if we are coming to the point of responding in the level of the unconscious to the I am presence as the father figure or in the unconscious to the mother figure, we are then in contact with the highest manifestation of our counterpart, our twin flame. You can see how the fallen woman or the femme fatale as well as the fallen masculine, if we allow that presence to remain in our unconscious and do not see it as a specter, as something that is not ourselves but something that is residing there as a point of de psychological development or karmic development, if we do not see it as separate from ourself, then we will be its instrument. We will be the instrument of this specter that is in itself, you might say, a sort of dweller. It dwells there as a conglomerate of our images of father or of mother. And so until we see it for what it is and our souls as wed alchemically to Christ, we are not objective. And when we are not objective is when we give vent to, through our speech and through our feelings and our thoughts, to the untransmuted masculine as women, to the untransmuted feminine as men. So let us watch what we put out and recognize that there is somebody occupying that unconscious who has done so without our leave. And that is the formation of a clay mold of a persona, a mask of father, a mask of mother handed down to us in the stages of development of non-discrimination and of absolute trust in parents. Now that we have come to the point of desiring integration with our divine parents and with Alpha and Omega, we then can take the best of our human parents, the best of the Ascended Masters and the Elohim, and create our own clay image which is then fired and becomes permanent. This is the heart and essence of this message from Carl Jung, who did have a profound understanding of the human psyche. Thus, Jung would explain Zalem's attraction to Lolix and her attraction to him as anima and animus projection. More simply, his anima fell for her animus. <laughs> Zalem projected into Lolix his bad mother. Lolix projected into Zalem her bad father, which she had and is described in the book. Neither one was ready to give up the bad parent, and so they had to come together in the relationship of their bad parents un until this could be resolved. What we find out later in the book is that it is never resolved until his most recent embodiment. This particular interchange could not be resolved for 12,000 years. Their souls had to grow, their karmic cycles had to return, their psyches had to be ready. This is why I think it's so important to know this book, to know its contents, because we must shorten the days of our travail and of our returning karma. We want it to return in this life 
we want to graduate with maximum credits, hopefully the whole 100%. So to accelerate the process, we must understand the path of the Ruby Ray, as well as these profound principles of psychology. Zalem projects his negative anima, the negative elements of his own feminine nature, and his resentment, anger, and guilt toward his mother into his relationship with Lolix. His negative anima has been formed at least partially from his internalization of his mother's negative behavior toward him and his father. To summarize, there are a complex set of motivations that Zalem expresses in his relationship with Lolix. First, he is asserting his masculinity, thereby proving himself as a man. Second, Zalem desires to symbolically heal his mother and raise her up through his relationship with Lolix. This is a very common situation where people marry their fathers or their mothers personality in a different body to heal them because the child always feels guilty for the sins of his parents, that he has caused the shortcomings of his parents. So therefore, he must heal his parents. Three, he desperately wants the bad mother to love him, and at the same time, he seeks to punish her. For her part, Lolix is playing out her self-hatred and desire for self-punishment by subjecting herself to Zalem's cold treatment. You will remember that her father was the cruel chief of the Chaldean armies. She in turn worshipped power and wanted to conquer the masculine so she could gain power herself. The drama heightens when Lolix becomes pregnant and Zalem arranges for the child to be placed in a home secretly provided. In so doing, Zalem rejects Lolix as the mother of his child. He is on the one hand hostile to Lolix and on the other hand rejecting himself by rejecting his own child. The deadly nature of their unconscious drives is given full play when Lolix becomes pregnant a second time and arranges to have an abortion without telling Zalem. Finally, Zalem determines that he can no longer stand the combination of his affair with Lolix and his unrequited, unfulfilled love for Anzime. At first, he hopes that Lolix will tire of him, but when she doesn't, he determines to get rid of her, as we will read later in the book. His actions from that point on lead to his ultimate self-destruction. Zalem's self-defeating behavior has been characterized by Freudian analysts as an attempt to undo and thereby resolve the original trauma by repeating it, each time in the hope of a different ending. Judith Viorst deals with this repetition compulsion syndrome in her book, Necessary Losses. There is, in human nature, a compulsion to repeat. Indeed, it is called the repetition compulsion. It impels us to do again and again what we have done before, to attempt to restore an earlier state of being. It impels us to transfer the past, our ancient longings, our defenses against those longings, onto the present. Thus, whom we love and how we love are, are revivals, unconscious revivals of early experience, even when revival brings us pain. And although we may play Iago instead of Othello, Desdemona instead of Iago, we will act out the same old tragedies unless awareness and insight intervene. That little boy, for instance, may play out his helplessness as a passive, submissive husband. He may play out his murderous rage as a wife-beating husband. He may choose his mother's role and become a cold, you have it to beg me for it, husband. Or he may, like his absent father, simply abandon his wife and his own son to their fate. The little boy may marry the psychological spitting image of his mother. He may work his wife over until she becomes that mother. He may ask his wife the impossible, and then when she refuses him, he may rail, you always refuse me, just like my mother. In repeating the past, that boy might repeat his fury or humiliation or grief, or he might repeat the tactics by which he beat back fury, humiliation, grief. In repeating the past, he will update the script to include the shadings of subsequent experience. But whom he loves and how he loves will reflect that whining, pleading, raging boy. For many men, the denial of dependency on their mother is repeated in their subsequent relationships, sometimes by an absence of any sexual interest in women, sometimes by a pattern of loving and leaving them. 
For other men and women, however, dependency is the point of love relationships, and whomever they take to bed will always be, at least in their head, the ever yearned for gratifying mother. We repeat the past by reproducing earlier conditions, challenging as that can sometimes be. Like the woman described by Freud, who managed to find not one, not two, but three different husbands, all of whom fell fatally ill soon after they were married and subsequently had to be nursed by her on their deathbed. A lesbian relationship like the one Karen Snow described in her novel, Willow, may also repeat love patterns of early childhood. Out of boredom, Pete takes a job welding in an aircraft plant, but the long hours of manual labor do not change her into the man. She is still the self-sacrificing one who will continue to cook and wash and iron and scrub floors. She will spend large chunks of her wages on Willow. The masculine-feminine bond is frail compared with this mother-daughter bond. Each girl is merely moving in grooves that were carved deep in her early in childhood. Willow has always been the aloof princess served and scolded by a coarse, martyred woman. In fact, by two martyred women, her mother and her sister. Pete has always been subservient to a glamorous mother who was usually away from home achieving. She has been housekeeper and cook, too, for a busy, burly father who wanted a son. In describing his taste in women, the baby doctor political activist Benjamin Spock also reveals a repetition compulsion, for as he points out, I have always been fascinated by rather severe women, women I then could charm despite their severity. The model for these women, as Dr. Spock is well aware, was his own demanding and highly critical mother. And if in his early 80s he is indeed a most exceptionally charming man, the wish to win over his mother may help explain why. I have always been amazed, he says, that men who were able to love somewhat soft women, such conquests, he suggests, are too easy to matter. I always needed someone who thought I was special but who also offered a challenge. He says that both his first wife, Jane, and his second wife, Mary Morgan, are versions, although in quite different ways, of this type. Because Dr. Spock volunteered to give permission for you and Mary to talk about me behind my back, let me note here that Mary Morgan disagrees. She maintains that she isn't this critical type of woman that Spock is describing, but she adds, he keeps trying to make me into that person, which is also, of course, a compulsion to repeat. We also repeat the past by superimposing parental images onto the present, myopic as that frequently can be, failing to recognize that being gentle doesn't have to mean being weak. Daddy, alas, was gentle, but he was weak. That silence may be companionable, not punishing mother's silences were always punishing. And that gentle, quiet people may be offering something new if we could but see it. We even repeat the past when we quite consciously are trying not to repeat it. Hopeless as that may turn out to be, like the woman who disdained her parents' conventional and patriarchal marriage and decided that hers would have an entirely new format. Was her mother completely ruled by her bossy husband? Well, then this lady's mate would be the ruled over type, and furthermore, she would be so unconventional, modern, and free that she would openly bring her lovers into their house. But she then allowed her lovers to abuse her and humiliate her. I suppose her notion of modern was anything goes, and so in the freewheeling life as an autonomous woman and wife, she arranged to repeat her mother's despised submissiveness. The repetition compulsion, writes Freud, explains why this one is always betrayed by his friends, and why that one is always abandoned by his protégés, and why each of a lover's love affairs may pass through similar stages and end the same way. For although there are people, writes Freud, who seem to be pursued by a malignant fate or possessed by some demonic power, their fate is for the most part arranged by themselves and determined by early infantile influences. I would comment on that, that our fates are determined by ourselves through all of our past lives, incarnations, and karma, in addition to that infantile influences on our psychology. They are but a speck in a long chain of specks of lifetimes we have lived. It seems reasonable to us to wish to transfer the pleasing past onto the present, to seek to repeat the delights of earlier days, to fall in love with those who resemble the first beloved objects of our affection, to do it again because we loved it the first time. If mom was truly wonderful, why shouldn't her son want to marry a girl like the girl who married dear old dad? Surely all normal love, it needn't be kinky, it needn't be blatantly incestuous, is bound to partake in part of transference love. 
Repeating the good makes sense, but we have trouble understanding the compulsion to repeat what causes pain. And, wh and while Freud has tried to explain this compulsion as part of a dubious concept called the death instinct, it can also be understood as our hopeless effort to undo, rewrite the past. In other words, we do it, and we do it, and we do it, and do it again in the hope that this time the ending will be different. We keep repeating the past when we were helpless and acted upon, trying to master and change what has already happened. In repeating painful experience, we are refusing to lay to rest our childhood ghosts. We continue to clamor for something that cannot be. No matter how hard they clap for us now, she will never clap for us then. We have to relinquish that hope. We have to let go. For we cannot climb into a time machine, become that long gone child, and get what we want when we oh so desperately wanted it. The days for that getting are over, finished, done. We have needs we can meet in different ways, in better ways, in ways that create new experience. But until we can mourn that past, until we can mourn and let go of that past, we are doomed to repeat it. That is a very profound and accurate assessment of our lives, the necessity of mourning the past, and that's what the book is all about, necessary losses, to give up the past, to recognize we cannot relive the past, we cannot make up for a lost time, we can't go back and have a perfect scene on the stage of life. It was as it was, we're on the stage today, we must move forward. This concludes another section of this lecture and gives us the perfect opportunity to take our dinner break and for those arriving for the evening service to come in and start their decrees. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>